The problem that we have right now is the fact that when it comes to justice um, for people in America, period, I don't care who you are, um, when it comes to justice, we have financial, um, your financial background or your financial status has more to do with anything than uh, any other aspect in regards to the criminal justice system. Welcome to Conversations. I'm your host, Muqtadar Khan. And today, as you see, I have a rising star in Delaware politics with me, Mr. Eugene Young. I remember people talking about him even before we knew about him. We knew that he was going to be a star. That's something very interesting. So everyone would tell me I'm talking about four or five years ago. Uh, this was the time when you were running for mayor of Wilmington. Uh, and uh, and this is before COVID. So, uh, so uh, most people in Delaware uh, know about you, uh, Eugene. So uh, before I go any further, um, there are some administrative things that people have to do, which is if you're listening to this channel for the first time, please subscribe to Conversations, like the video, uh, and make sure that you ring the bell icon. Eugene Young is currently the director of uh, Delaware Housing, Delaware State Housing Administration, it's called, right? So, yeah, housing authority. Yep, you're, you're, you're so, good. <laughs> so you are basically in the cabinet of the governor in that sense, isn't that? Correct. And Correct. Before, before that, you were the CEO and president of the Wilmington Metropolitan Urban League. Correct. Uh, and Correct. you also started the Network Delaware. Yes, sir. I did work on a couple of projects with Network Delaware, and that's when I heard a lot about you. This was prior to wow. uh, COVID, and uh, this was especially at the time when ICE was being <laughs> weaponized uh, against uh, a lot of uh, people who live in our state. Uh, so welcome to Conversations, uh, Eugene. I, I'm, I, I have to say this, Dr. Khan. I am so thankful and honored to be here with you. I um my my first video i remember watching um i've watched a couple of videos obviously but one of the first ones was with uh senator good friend uh amazing woman uh senator tizzy lockman um now um senate majority whip uh tizzy lockman uh and um professor uh ted davis and talking about a lot of the issues around race um, that were coming up at the time. It was really, really great interview and um, appreciate a lot of the different insights um, and the conversations um, <laughs> that we had. So I, I, I but even since then, um, you know, there was some, I, I continuously watch your videos. So um, it was interesting, even your coverage of uh, uh, the BRIC summit. Uh, was very interesting as well. I, 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 I was. I think it's just interesting what's going on with um, BRICS and uh, how it relates to G seven and things of that nature. So that that coming up was also um, great to watch as well. So I can go on about your videos, but I just want to say <laughs> thank you. Well, and I, and I, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for 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 that. And so so let me throw some easy balls at you. <laughs> One very simple. Uh, why are you running for Congress? You are obviously running to win the Democratic nomination. Uh, okay. And in this state, which is so dark blue, <laughs> if you win the primaries, uh, unless you do something really, really crazy, uh, you are through. So tell us, uh, Eugene, why are you running for Congress? Well, I am running for Congress because I believe um, my years, my background, my 20 years of service uh, provides me with a very unique lens to talk about the issues that are facing everyday Americans, in particular, everyday Delawareans. Um, whether it's my work um, with the Delaware Center for Justice around criminal justice reform, or where I started my first work graduating from college, I had two degrees, one in information systems, the other in sociology, came home, to, uh, back home from Del to Delaware, co-founded a nonprofit organization for children, focusing on a lot of the issues impacting families. Um, so for me, it's been the time working with this uh, Delaware Elite co-founding that organization, working around criminal justice reform, working around um, civil rights um, and advocacy in those areas. And then uh, leading up to my, my time now, 
as serving as uh, the director of housing for the state of Delaware. So um, I believe my 20 years of experience provides me uh, with a unique vantage point in talking about the issues, uh, but also shows that I have been very solutions driven and focusing on um, answers for many of those problems as well. And so that's what leads me into this moment right now. I recognize there's a lot of work that needs to be done and we need a, a different lens in, in focusing on these issues. You know, there is an underlying assumption uh, in this whole thing is that, that the Congress is effective. Uh, and so if we get to Congress, we can get a lot of things done. So for example, I was going through uh, some of the things that you would like to do when you get to Congress, uh, create jobs, meaningful jobs for everybody, try to improve uh, basically the health care situation uh, in Delaware. But most of the things seems to be very broad. I mean, those are like national level uh, things that can only be achieved if the president would set an agenda and the entire party would align. But what can you do as a congressman for Delawareans specifically? Like, sure. So what's interesting right now is, A, our delegation right now at this present moment, I mean, about 10 years ago, it was taken out, but it's been uh, um, congressional, um, they call it specific, they have a specific title, but many people call them air Um Being able to fund different projects in the state, make sure... Um, the state has projects that lead um, in connection with the having the delegation work with the state to make sure that there's funding for projects that are needed within said state. So this occurs a lot. I work with the federal delegation quite often um, on different projects where we coordinate federal dollars um, through them to come into our state to um, impact whether it be housing, infrastructure, um, all these important issues, environmental issues. So, I mean, the federal delegation um, in this role specifically of Congress does a great deal in providing resources to our state. I mean, I can say this as being director of housing. Uh, we received uh, $135 million from the federal government uh, that we were able to get out to keep renters um, in their homes during COVID. $135 million, 25,000 households were impacted, um, helping to keep people stable. Uh, we also received $50 million in mortgage assistance so that no one lost their home or were foreclosed upon from COVID. Um, and so these funds were federal dollars um, that our two senators, Carver Coons, and our Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester specifically advocated on um, and made sure that a smaller state like ours does not get left behind. So that's what I plan to do, certainly, um, in going to Congress and being afforded the opportunity to do so is be able to make sure that there's resources coming back to our state, working with our state um, and, and cabinet secretaries and governor um, in order to make sure that the resources are here and then also pushing quality legislation that will impact and change the lives of everyday Delawareans. So as you look at Delaware and uh, in your effort to, to represent Delaware in the Congress, we have only one seat uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, so when you look at the state of Delaware, what are the areas in which you think uh, attention is required? Like what, the, what do you need to fix when you get to Congress? What will be the top three things that you would like uh, to get done on say day one? Like I'm here now, this is what Delaware needs and I'm going to work to deliver that. Like what are those things? Sure, so for me, I think uh, a lot of this boils down to um, going back to what I said for, first around my, my purview and things I'm, I've seen over my time uh, in working in the state. So the first one will be housing. Um, our state is behind 21,000 units. Um, it is our nation, and it's not just Delaware, our nation, many people will, many experts will say, is somewhere hovers between four and six million units um, that our nation is behind. And so for me, we have to get more units in, uh, uh, up and available for the residents of our country and the residents of the state. Uh, and so that would be prime first first thing. And also, there are not that many, I would even, I would beg to even say, I probably don't think there's more than two or three, if that, um, Congress people or U.S. senators that have a background of actually running, being the housing secretary for a state. So for me, I see how federal dollars impact us. I also see how 
our state cannot um, provide uh, the funding alone in order to get us out of this large housing hole. Um, each year, um, over the last 20, 30 years, you normally get around, our state is given around $10 million to affordable housing. Uh, this past year, thankful for the governor and also our state legislature, we were able to put $122 million this year for housing. Uh, why do I say that? Because it's just the down payment. There needs to be um, greater investment in housing as we move forward and ahead. Uh, because we have to make sure people have quality housing available to them. Because right now, it's a lack of and people are becoming priced out. So that, Second, 100, that 122 is from state it is from the federal, it is a mixture of state and federal funds. Uh, it is It is a mixture of state and federal, the majority of it being federal funds. So um, I would say around 60% federal funds. Um, and then the governor uh, and the state legislature added uh, another tranche of funds as well um, to get us even further over. And in, in, uh, in when it comes to that down payment in housing. So uh, housing would be one, I would say universal health care coverage is another. Um, one of the big issues that we have right now is I just spoke with a business leader yesterday and he and I were talking and he said to me that two things that stuck out um, uh, like a sore thumb, it, two things. One was the fact that he has 10 employees, but he would be able to afford 11 if he were to actually, if there were universal coverage, if he did not have such high skyrocketing um, uh, okay. costs for healthcare, and he could literally employ a whole nother individual. He says, he even describes it as such as, I have a whole nother individual working for me called healthcare. And it's a, a whole nother person, right? Um, the second thing he said to me, would, now this was very interesting about US competitiveness. So the second thing he said was, I, if I post a job, um, the biggest, um, if I post a job for um, that is remote working, he said, the bigger number of um, people that apply for said job come from other countries, Canada, UK, Germany. Why is that? Because they have universal coverage. And so they can afford to, because they have coverage in some way, shape, form or fashion, they're now able to take advantage of this American job. And we're seeing this more and more um, as we have more remote workers and things of that nature. We have to be more competitive as a country. We are the last global uh, industrialized nation without universal coverage. And I think it is literally in many places killing us. Um, so I would say those are two aspects from the business sense, but even from the individual side, 60% of all people that file for bankruptcy do it because of healthcare related costs. So I think we need to start thinking about whether we start out with single payer, move to Medicare for all, whatever the case may be, this system that we have now is not working. And we need to focus on universal coverage. Uh, third, I would say um, is- So, so you know, would support Medicare for all? I would support Medicare for all. I would support single payer. I would support something that gets us out of the rut that we are in right now. Um, I think the model is to be determined. Um, I'm not going to, I think there's a lot more discussion and dialogue that would need to be had on whether it's more of this nationalized like UK model or if it's um, the Canadian model. Um, but I think we need something different than what we have going on right now because I'll, I'll give it to you, Dr. Kanaus, I'll give it to you from this perspective as well. We have, um, I, was, I was giving numbers to, to someone yesterday that, because uh, we were talking about gun deaths and we we're talking about homicides. And um, if you look at the CDC report, you'll actually see that more gun deaths are suicides yeah. than homicide. And most people don't, I think most people don't think, think about that perspective, that more people are killing themselves and going through suicide than we have people being killed by someone else. Um, both are bad by by all means, all sorts of means. But it says a lot about our country. And also, um, there's recent data from the CDC that shows some higher suicide rates are coming in are those at the later um, ages of life, like 64, 65, 60s, because many people are more concerned that they don't have enough money to actually live off as they move forward in life. We have, there's a study, Axios came out with a study recently uh, I forgot the specific, I forget the name of the specific group that did the, uh, 
they had provided the data, but there is a study that shows that 60% of elderly fear more of running out of money than death itself. I think that's astounding. I think that's a very much astounding. And I think how we judge nations and how we judge countries and how we judge states is how we take care of two groups of people, the, the young, the children, those who need our help in the beginning, and those who are elderly who need our help at the end. And I think as a country, we need to do better with both, if that makes sense. So you know, uh, it's not just that people don't have health care, even those who have health care in the sense of insurance, I probably have the best insurance that you could get in Delaware. Mm -hmm. Let me mm -hmm. tell you, I'm not getting good health care. Uh, mm -hmm. A few nights ago, I had a scare. Mm -hmm. I actually thought I was having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And so guess what? I had to call a classmate from Hyderabad in India wow. and, and tell him what my symptoms were. Wow. And he said, uh, sit down. I sat down. He says, does it, it still hurt? I said, yes. He said, so you're not having a heart attack, but go to ER. So I went to ER at around 12 o'clock to Christiana Care. And nobody saw me till morning. I could have died there. It's a different mm. thing that I was okay, but there was a, an old couple which was brought in with an accident and there was nobody to help. I was helping all these old people go to the bathroom most of the night, uh, lying mm. there in a the corridor, uh, waiting to be seen by a doctor. And I kept wondering, okay, this is not serious for me, but what if it was serious and the, and the doctors come four, four and a half hours later? So. So I think there is a lot of problems with our healthcare. It's not just access to the system. It's not as if the system is great. Once you get access to it, you get you have to wait months to see a doctor. Yeah, it's. I, I would say there's, and and let me be very clear. There are certain aspects that we are astoundingly um, high level, high rating when it comes to our healthcare. Right there's because it's not all one number. Right. So when if you have cancer. Um, if you've been diagnosed with cancer, you, you're in a good place with the medical research that we have, with um, certain supports that we have, um, and um, ways that you can be helped. You're in a good place being here in America. But on the preventative care side, um, on the from the aspect of people who have to go to, um, because they cannot afford their primary, a primary care doctor because healthcare costs is too high, they use the emergency rooms. As, as their checkups or catch-alls when issues occur, it is our system is, is backwards. And because of the fact that heart disease, the greatest cause of death in our state is heart disease. So we these are things that if we're able to have people able to take advantage of um, the checkups, the proper measures of meeting with their doctor regular, regularly and routinely, it can help along in some of these areas and we can save lives. I would even... Um, talk about it's not even just the physical body, but when we talk about mental health as well, uh, that's a major aspect of this. I, I was speaking to someone a couple months ago and they said, I need mental health, but my insurance only covers three visits. Like these are some of the issues that people are going through day in and day out. And then we wonder why we get people then resorting to drugs, people then resorting to alcoholism as ways to numb said pain. So we, this is something I think is very critical and important um, for our nation and for our state as we move forward. Access to healthcare and <laughs> access to quality healthcare. Access, yes, access to quality healthcare. I think we need either single pair. I would be for Medicare for all, um, obviously, but I, we, whatever we're in right now, it is not, it's yeah. not serving collectively as a country. It's not serving us all as a whole. I noticed that you work with Senator Cory Booker in New Jersey. How was that experience? Uh, I will say uh, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. I um, I worked for Senator Booker a little over two years, um, and it was very unique, uh, very unique opportunity because I was with him every day. So I was literally um, with him when he was mayor. Uh, I started. I remember the day I started June 5th, 2013. And I was with him for about two years. And because of my job as his like his specific aide, I was with him 24 seven. So um, it was by far one of the greatest um, opportunities to learn about leadership style, to learn about hard work, learn about connecting with people, 
um, learn about being who you are, not just when people are watching, um, but also when no one's, when you think no one's watching. Um, he is uh, the consummate leader. Like I, I owe so much to him. I get emotional even thinking about it. There's two um, elected officials that really have changed and shaped my life. I would say kind of actually three or four, but um, the two big ones are um, obviously Governor John Carney for giving me an opportunity to serve in his cabinet, um, opportunity of a lifetime, and Senator Cory Booker, and then also representatives Stephanie T. Bolden and Helene Keeley. Um, I served as their aide in the, Del in the Delaware General Assembly. But um, my time working for Senator Booker was absolutely amazing. It changed, it literally changed my trajectory. Um, every time when I text him, I say like, I cannot, I know he gets tired of it, but I have to be, my father would say, my father, my late father would always say, uh, son, don't, don't nobody owe you nothing. And so you be thankful for what people, the kindness that people provide to you because they don't owe that to you. And for him to take me under his wing um, was an absolute opportunity in my lifetime. But more importantly, it's for me, learning to how do we give back? How do I get back to find, um, provide some of those same teaching uh, teachings that he gave me and some of the same things I learned from him? Um, how do I give back, that back to others? And, and that's been my, my journey moving forward. You know, I mean, John, John Carney is a, a, a fantastic governor and uh, I think yes. I'm lucky to have him for the past few years. But uh, Cory Booker, I always thought of him as Obama 2.0. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, yes, and I hope he will still soon run for president. I think he should be running soon. We need younger people in the office. Um, tell me a little bit more, or tell our viewers uh, a bit of the work that you did as president and CEO of the Wilmington Metropolitan Urban League, and what kind of an institution it is. It is basically a community organization, isn't it? Correct. So uh, the Urban League. So there's um, the, the yeah, Urban League. Yeah, the National the National, yes, the National Urban League um, is based in New York City. The, the president CEO of the National Urban League is Mark Morial. Um, outside of the National Urban League, which is based in New York City, there are affiliates all around the country. So there's um, uh, the affiliate here. There's another one in Philadelphia. There's one in Baltimore, New York, D.C. Uh, you name it. Any major city, there's an urban league. You name a major city, there's an urban league. And many of the urban leagues focus on uh, community support. So that's everything from um, they'll have child care. They'll do direct service programming with after school programs. Uh, they'll do uh, workforce development training. Philadelphia is known for the workforce development work that they do. Um, there's all different types of, of styles here in Delaware, which is unique. We're probably the most unique urban league. Um, when we were actually founded um, some odd 24, 25 years, 20, 24 years ago, uh, the urban league was, it was a variety of people around the table. One of the main ones was Jim Gilliam Sr. And Jim Gilliam Sr. and Tony Allen, who was the first CEO of the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League, they thought of this aspect of, we want to focus in on policy. Um, what, how can policy impact the lives of the people within our state? There's enough great organizations doing direct services. We want to focus in on the policy perspective. The National Urban League actually told them, no, they will not give you, the, we will not give you the charter. We will not allow you to, we do, we do direct services, not policy and so on and so forth. Lo and behold, they ended up still doing it anyway. They worked with the nationals to make it happen. Um, and Tony Allen was given the CEO of the Year Award almost like two or three years later. So something good was <laughs> something good was working. And they published reports. Um, one that Dr. Ted Davis was um, uh, was involved with, um, and they they published different reports around race, around social class issues, around um, economic development issues in the state, and it was a big splash. Um, and one of the things that happened next after Tony Allen left, Lisa Blunt Rochester was the president and CEO of the Urban League. And she ran it. And while Jack Markell was the board chair, they changed it a little bit. So it was policy and um, program focus. So that's the Urban League that I inherited. So we did a lot on, we created on the program side, we created a fellowship program 
to train people to be leaders uh, within our state. So we started a fellowship program called the James H. Gilliam Senior Fellowship Program. People come in, Delaware is a relationship-driven state, right? Is I'd say the biggest difference between Delaware and New Jersey and other states, large states for that matter is, in New Jersey, if Dr. Khan, if I have what you want, you have what I want, but um, I don't know you, we'll still do business because it's New Jersey, it's 10 million people, I don't expect to know you, right? Even if I don't like you, but I do like you, Dr. Khan. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but we will still do business either way. Delaware is very relationship driven. We have a million people in our state, more chickens than people in our state, random fun fact. And so, um, and so everything is relationship driven. So oftentimes if I do not know you, Dr. Khan, then people, and I'll say, oh, I don't know you. And then a good ally of mine doesn't know you as well. Uh, I may not work with that person because it's such a small state. I should know you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for, for many people that keeps them on the outside of being involved and engaged. And so we created this fellowship program, recognizing that we want to have future leaders come in, get quality training of how to, um, to, to organize for their community, how to research policy issues, how to talk with leaders around um, issues that are important, how to create policy briefs. So we created this and we have leaders from all around the state and outside of the state come in and provide a lot of the leadership skills and impart a lot of wisdom to them. And this fellowship program is now six years in, training leaders who are state senators, leaders who are uh, run nonprofits, leaders who are chief of staffs of organizations, uh, Marquis Gideon, who runs Nerded Now, large organization in Wilmington. So it's a wide array of individuals um, that have done some great work from this fellowship program, and we're incredibly proud of them. So it's the policy side and the program side, and I was there for four years. It was one of the greatest opportunities I had um, to work with a wide array of people up and down the state on issues impacting our state as a whole. So it's, it's more like a think tank, which also does advocacy. Correct, correct, correct. But is it focused on just the African-American community or is it uh, statewide and... So it is it is um, focused statewide because here's the issue. Um, we would have uh, we would run programs out of schools where it would be uh, predominantly black and maybe Latino. But you would always have white um, young people as well who are struggling. Um, we would run different programs in Dover where we would have, you know, we have white men and women and or young people who are at the, the edge when it comes to financially, just like in the black and Latino community, in the Asian community, the Muslim community, the Jewish community, like we have a lot of communities that are struggling within our state and our job is to meet those needs. Um, we cast, when I was there, let me be, when I was there, we casted a wide tent and they're still doing the same thing, but we cast, excuse me, a wide net um, and recognizing the fact that we're all connected. And especially in such a small state, if something happens to you, it happens to me. Because we're, it's not like this is a state of 40 million people. Um, this is a state where I may meet your relative going to the grocery store, or I may meet someone else that you're connected to at another event or engagement. So this is this is like the Delaware aspect of it, recognizing the fact that we must serve as many people as possible because it all impacts us one way or another. You know, after the George Floyd episode, there was this huge Black Lives Matter movement in the country. Uh, and uh, a lot of us participated. I remember marching with my children at that time. Uh, and uh, and subsequently, that's when I had a conversation with Senator Lockman and Ted Davis, who is my colleague. Uh, uh, do you think there has been a significant improvement? Uh, uh, and do you think that Congress needs to do more? Uh, oh, there's, there's, there's certainly... Um, there is certainly more that needs to be done. I think people, it's it raised to a high level of consciousness with people um, around the issues around uh, race, but there is still so much um, that needs to be done, banning certain chokeholds, understanding the lack of um, economic wealth that are within many of these different communities that we speak of. All these things are part of a larger, broader conversation as we talk about race. Um, and, you know, when, when 
you look at some of the data and some of the numbers, it's, it's astounding. It is absolutely astounding. I mean, um, there's there's numbers that show where black home ownership right now is the same as it was in 1964. Like we as uh, black families have not um, have not been able to um, kind of come back from uh, the uh, 2008 the housing hit uh, the housing crunch in uh, 2000 between 2008 2010. Black families still have not come back from that. Um, or whether it's the fact that. If you're a black woman uh, in this state, you are more than three times likely um, to have a mortality rate in giving birth, and your uh, your child, your baby, um, has more than a five percent, I believe, mortality rate as well. Um, just giving birth, and this does not um, this does not mean um, does not uh, it does not change based upon one's financial status either. So um, it, it's many of this has been highlighted with um, Serena Williams, who just had complications from her child uh, giving birth to her child. And she is probably the most one of the most fit women <laughs> in the world who has the wealth of resources. But even she had issues um, in giving birth. There was a track star that recently died giving birth, um, uh, a black woman who was a, a track star. So these are issues within um, the community that we certainly have. We also see homelessness for Black men in Delaware um, creeping up right now. Um, and we also see homelessness for whites in Sussex County creeping up as well. So um, these are big issues um, that we need to talk about and to deal with. But um, a lot of them fundamentally boil down to housing, quality working, quality jobs uh, that pay a quality wage, um, quality health care. Um, and supports. And so that is part of the reason why I'm I'm running for Congress. Are Democrats also guilty of racial discrimination? The fact that Delaware is a blue state, has been a blue state for a while, and yet we see so much of, uh, uh, shall we say, lag in, in, in African, African American community when it comes to economic uh, development, when it comes to educational achievement. Uh, are the Democrats also as guilty of not addressing the problems that the African-American community faces uh, and uh, not just Republicans alone. So I would say this, uh, as Democrats, we need to step up. We need to step up for uh, many of the communities that vote us in every year, vote many of the Democrats in over the years. Um, we need to step up for those who are at the margins and recognizing that we're not, as just as a whole, Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, Green Party, like we're all not doing enough. The problem that we have right now is the fact that when it comes to justice um, for people in America, period, I don't care who you are, um, when it comes to justice, we have financial, um, your financial background or your financial status has more to do with anything than uh, any other aspect in regards to the criminal justice system. So I will give an example. I have a friend. I've had, this is multiple cases. I have a friend, um, I've had a friend who, um, and not just this one friend in particular, but other cases as well, but um, he calls me one day and says, uh, I need your help. I said, how can, how can I help you? You're, what can I do? He said, um, I'm in jail. And it's for something I did not do. But I do not have $250 to bail myself out. And so um, I ran, obviously being a friend, I ran to, um, to a bail bondsman and I ended up paying the $250 so that he wasn't staying in jail from Friday until Monday. And if he were in that weekend, he would have lost custody of his kid because then um the judge would say you're in jail and uh, you know his it, it would lead to further issues um and the same thing happened with an employee of mine uh, a couple of years ago i had an employee um in one of my previous jobs that uh same thing happened called me up i've known him for years good man same thing he was as alleged issue uh i had to bet two hundred dollars I had to go and bail him out for 200 hours. If not, he was spent the night in jail. And so why am I bringing this up? Because 
uh, we have a criminal justice system, excuse me, a criminal justice system. A two-tier system. Yeah, a two-tier system where it, but it penalizes, if it penalizes those who are in poverty. And so um, I oftentimes um, think about the fact that um, we need to do more, recognizing the fact that too many people are at the margins and we're not doing enough to support them and recognizing that we're, we're destroying lives in some, some cases. If you have a, if you stay in jail one night, you're more likely to get, um, get in contact with hepatitis C, your physical assault, HIV AIDS, all these things come. And, and then also the longer you stay in, stay in jail um, uh, by not being able to um, post bond, it makes you more actually likely to commit said crime because your your life can be in shatters when you by the time you come out. So um, for me, I look at this as a larger, we need to take a larger as, as all parties, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. Um, we need to be more focused in on these areas of criminal justice reform. We have kids right now that have um, opioid addiction issues and we're penalizing them. We're, we're sending them to jail and so on and so forth. We're just now as a country starting to move into treatment rather than penalization. But we are, um, we need to move into a, a standpoint where we're getting people the help they need and not pushing them to be reoffenders and moving forward. So that's the way I look at it as a whole. We, as an entire system, we need to focus on not having, as many people call it, a debtor's prison for those who are impoverished um, are the first ones to be in and the last ones to get out. A broad question, Eugene. How much faith do you have in American democracy now? One of the things that our own president says is that uh, that our democracy is at risk and we need to uh, work hard to save our democracy. Uh, the, uh, if you look at any of the indices, uh, America is no more rated as a full democracy. We are on every democracy index. We are a struggling uh, democracy. Uh, so uh, how... Are you worried about American democracy? Do you think that we actually need to work on just improving the quality of our democracy rather than also improving the quality of the goods that the government provides its citizens? Correct. Right. So I, I believe that um, when it comes to our democracy as, as a nation, it comes down to us as, this becomes like more of like an individual aspect. And the individual aspect of us being, people being involved and engaged, and also recognizing the fact that there's gonna be people that disagree with us. That is a part of the process. Um, and of democracy doesn't mean, um, having a solid democracy does not mean that people do not disagree, that people do not, I would even say, absolutely disagree um, in what you have going on. But I think there's a sense of people are um, upset because there, there's a sense of civility that I think people believe we're lacking right now, a sense of common seeing the, the, the next man as oneself or a reflection of oneself. And I think that is what we need to continue be, to be moving to, recognize, recognizing the fact that we're tied to each other in this. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of like taking this micro um, level aspect of Delaware and putting it to the macro level of just our country. Because in Delaware, we treat each other good for, uh, for a variety of reasons. But one of the fact is, I'm probably gonna see you again. And it's, it's, in, it's advantageous to me to treat you with respect, decency, kindness, um, not just because I'm supposed to do it anyway, but because of the fact I may see your brother as soon as I go to the local store. It's just, we're a smaller state. And so it's taking that sense of civility and, civility and recognizing the fact that Yes, our democracy, there are certain things that have, January 6th is a prime example where um, pe many people, and rightfully so, have put into question our democracy. But I think um, you go throughout our country, we've always disagreed with one another. We've always um, fought with one another on issues. Um, we even had a civil war around issues, um, and rightfully so, right, um, in our country, um, where we fought for um, for, for the rights of um, freeing slaves and also the emancipation of slaves and also um, keeping our union, our actual union. So um, for me, I think, uh, yes, um, I understand people's, especially with January 6th, I understand people's uh, trepidation with our democracy, but also recognize the fact that 
this is something you work every day for a democracy. You work by engaging with people, communicating with people. I'm talking about issues that are impacting community members, um, not by being standoffish and pointing fingers. Well, you kind of answered my last question, but I'll still ask it. If there are a couple of things that uh, you want uh, Delawareans to remember about you, what would that be? Um, my 20 years of service within this state and how I'm thankful and fortunate just to be in this opportunity right now, right? Um, I'm incredibly thankful and how I look forward to serving all of Delaware. Um, our campaign, um, our kickoff, we had 300 people at our kickoff event, um, 300 people from a wide array of different areas in the state, from Claymont to Selbyville, Laurel and Seaford, to the beach community, Dover, Lewis, Wilmington, obviously, um, Claymont, recognize the fact that um, we're all in this together. And we will have, I, I, I tell people all the time, um, there's two things that I would say about this campaign. One is uh, we won't be outworked. Um, I'm an athlete by nature. Um, we will not be outworked. We will work um, ridiculously hard. And two is we will have the most diverse campaign in this race, point blank, period. Talking about the needs and issues impacting all Delawareans. And I'm not just saying white, black, Asian, Southeast Asian. I'm just not saying the, the typical um, demographics when people say diversity. I'm saying also diversity for um, those who are at different socioeconomic classes, um, diversity of geographic location of people coming to support, uh, diversity of faith, um, these all things, all these things come together to create this campaign, talking about issues impacting us all and recognize the fact that we all can do this. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene Young, for coming on Conversations and, and, uh, and talking to us so frankly and so candidly. And I think that if you do get elected, then Delaware will be lucky to have you as a representative in Congress. Thank you very much. Sir. Means the world. Thank you, Dr. Khan. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.